three, two, one. At a point of insecurity where the American public suffers from a myriad of uh, uh, like levels of disaster, we cannot afford to signal um, the kind of uh, precedent that, uh, like that Biden is looking to be to a, a sort of like a guy who is sort of leaning to left left leaning policies, and we cannot signal this person to look no different than Ronald Reagan like Republicans who support uh, the Republican Party but just stand against someone like Trump. Let's understand what these uh, never Trump Republicans look like and then understand what this embracing looks like and finally explain why this is going to be very terrible for us trying to win this election. First, never Trump Republicans. These are individuals who stand against Trump, but that's because they don't think that Trump embraces the values of the Republican Party. And they refer to other Republican presidents like Ronald Reagan, who they think represented those values. This is proof approved by the fact that the kind of video messaging that these uh, Republic, these uh, never Trump Republicans use often have like speeches of Reagan playing in the background, where they often signal Reagan as the kind of bright president with the right Republican values that existed. What does this signify? It signifies that a they have a strong uh, they they have a they have, they have an idea of uh, American pres uh, Republican presidents to be someone who's a strong Republican president who throws you back to the glory days of America like during the Cold War when they had Soviet uh, like uh, you know a very very strong anti-Soviet ideologies. It looks like number three that like true American presidents who go for freedom things like less taxes and etc. Values they feel like Trump don't fully embody. So it's important for us to understand that these aren't really individuals who go for liberal or more progressive values, but they're still stuck to values very, very much to the right of the margin, but like perhaps not as crazy as Trump's, right? So second, what does this embracing looks like? It looks like giving media airtime to these collectives, giving your own media airtime, like the uh, media machine that uh, like Biden and the, Repo uh, like, and, the, and, the, and the left sort of has some degree of control over. Second, it looks like having collective discussions with these individuals where you bring them to your platforms and talk with them. Third, it looks like campaigns that that shows that even Republicans perhaps don't stand for Trump. What does this mean? It means that either you, uh, you as Biden right now, to gain their support, have to form perpetual coalitions where you cannot dissociate with these individuals because you turn that campaign that already looks like to an extent that it's um, just about taking down Trump and mark it exactly as like taking down Trump regardless of cost, regardless of democratic values, where you're willing to stand with any, like, any kind of Republican, even uh, the likes of Ronald Reagan, to just take down Trump. Second, it, when you bring these individuals to your discussion, you're often going to have to give an answer to how you feel about these individuals. And you're often have to go, going to have to give very sympathetic answers. And these are answers that you cannot opt out in the long run. What does this mean? It means for America, where, who, where, whose people at a time are the most emotionally vulnerable and like structurally vulnerable because of things like recessions, things like job losses, things like COVID-19. And it puts these people in a position where they think that Biden is, an, is a pure establishment establishment Republican panderer and will do anything and succumb to any Republican policy just so that they can win. This is disastrous. Additionally, there are some issues that make this association even worse. It looks like A, so Biden having been very sympathetic to Republican-like policies in the past. It looks like Biden's early move, which was extremely tough on crime, where he had policies like the third time you do a crime, you're going to get life imprisonment regardless of the severity. It looks like his support for uh, like uh, the Iraq war and et cetera, where he actively supported George W. Bush's uh, like policies to Iraq war. All of this means that he is more likely to fall under. But secondly, it's the fact that he has mostly center policies and he's uniquely possible as a candidate to push towards the right, or at least have a perception of so. What does this mean? It means that as a conclusion, that due to the nature of these Republicans, the nature of American people right now, any and all hints will force an undelible association with the Republicans of the past and not the progressives that the Democrats right now seem to embody. This is disastrous. And we think that if we can prove to you that right now, all of this means that there is a, like a lot more uh, less chance for us to win the ne next election and it gives more power to Trump, we automatically win this debate. Why is this true? The first argument I'm going to bring is that this is that is that we are really the only side that that can break voter apathy in this debate? Why is this true and why is this important? It's because a historically these are uh, historically the most underprivileged of people have been left out of elections, but they also tend to be one of the strongest voters that side like that push elections to the side of the Republicans. These look like black voters, Hispanic voters, uh, and even like some white voters of low uh, like uh, who 
are, who are constantly look like losing jobs and etc. These are the kind of people that who helped Obama win when he campaigned in the last like uh, like you know past elections that he campaigned in. These are the people that helped Biden win the primaries against uh, Senator Bernie Sanders. These are the people that Biden has tried to get uh, get these people under. The important crucial nuance to understand when it comes to these people is that they have a lot of sacrifices for voting because of the things like like state voting registration laws which allow needs you to go to register a separate day than voting. Things like bureaucracy, which means that often voting happens on a work day, where you have to sacrifice a day of work to get to voting. This already means in status quo that these people are unlikely to go to vote anyway. But what happens is that since we are in the middle of an economic crisis, one day of lost work means so much more because it can cost you anything. Because you are replaceable often as a poor American worker, and there's a high level of employment and high number of people vying for your job. Even the smallest forces can push you, uh, like push you into not going to vote because that cost is so, so high. And we think this is pretty large a push to push you away, given that you are from those marginalized communities who Biden has once gone against and are now supporting Republicans who have historically gone against. Why was this going to change in, in status quo anyway? It was going to change because that that that, uh, that these people often understood that they need to, uh, like, they, they, that Biden was a, uh, was a candidate who stood for their values. When Biden worked with people like Bernie Sanders and actively had, uh, like, a coalitions with the, the people like this, where they worked in policies with people like this. This meant that there was a necessity and, and a feeling of empowerment for these people to come out. But all of this gets diluted when this association happens. And that's number one. If we think that we can't bring these people out to vote, we automatically stand to lose the election. The second reason is that it empowers Trump's media control, and it makes sure that he is more likely to win. Why is this true? Because right now, if you look at Biden's political ads, they mostly point to how Trump is doing a horrible job. Obama and him was amazing. Trump's re re attack here is to reinforce his own nostalgia and like point to Biden being problematic. There's a hurdle to this, however. The hurdle to this is that Biden's association with police and war are very much things of the past. And right now, the progressive things he's done has done a little bit to quell this image and makes it harder for Trump to attack him. But what happens is the moment you have this association, it is brought back to the present. And this means that Trump's immense social media and media power means that he can essentially use this price uh, to, this, to this maximum advantage. I don't think I have to explain why this is so important because it's really the reason how Trump came back, came to power for the first time in the first place. But what this means right now is that the current issues that are taking up a lot of the American conscious, things like Black Lives Matter, things like the crisis in COVID, which reinforces the necessity of all of these Democrat values, are all things that go against Biden. Because this image of tough, tough on crime, because this image on war funding, which takes away from national funding for crises, means that he's less likely to be looked as a probable solution, which means that individuals who want, even want to vote for him, even don't want Trump, have less of a reason and less of that motivation to fight that this problem and come back. The last reason is that, that when Biden is already seen as a bit of pro-establishment, that's a bit of a problem for these people. But the reason it's still OK, because at least it's the democratic establishment who stands for democratic values. What this move does is that it undoubtedly and indelibly ties him to Republican establishment. So people who already are anti-corporate -funding, funding now sees that he has probably ties to corporate funding to things like big oil and big pharma, which makes it horrible for these individuals to be able to support Biden. We think that our this policy will make will take voter apathy to the mass, max, will dilute Biden's image, and will be disastrous for taking Trump out in the next election. I'm proud to affirm. I thank the speaker for this speech. I'd now like to invite up the first negative speaker to start their team's case. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Okay. Great. 
It was a blatant lie from the affirmative team that the Never Trump supporters were people who aligned with Reagan, who was historically very anti-Black individuals yeah, and very yeah. pro-high incarcerations. The sorts of Never Trump supporters we're talking about are Mitt Romney, Susan Collins, and Lisa Markovsky, the types of people who are quite moderate, who lean more towards Biden and his policies than someone like Trump, and who are individuals who've historically been much more similar to Lincoln. Trump was a, someone you could draw a comparison to Reagan with, and that was incredibly detrimental to their case. I'm going to prove three things in this speech. Firstly, I'm going to prove that we're more likely to win the presidential election when we follow our democratic strategy. Secondly, that we're more likely to win Congress election. And thirdly, that we're more likely to win state elections. And firstly, just going to go into some clarification on what we think embracing looks like. And then I'm going to address one point of rebuttal on whether or not we would now be seen as Republican panderers or incite voter apathy if we were to pursue our policy under outside of the House. So back to what Democratic like embracing of these Never Trump supporters would look like. We think that it would look like agreeing in, with them in their opposition to Trump. We think that like it would look like um, saying that they are our preferred Republicans and preferencing them over Trump and his sort of Republican policies. We think that that is quite possible given some of those policies do align with particularly yeah, yeah. someone like Biden in regards to like corporation funding, et cetera. We think that secondly, we have a very limited political capital, particularly when we have groups like Fox News and media who are very anti-Democrats. We think that it's important then when we use that political capital Capital, that we aren't using it to shit on all Republicans when yeah, who we yeah. really need to target is Trump. So we think that um, when they say that, oh, we're going to put all our airtime towards these never Trump supporters, we think that what happens in the app world is they spend all their time rebutting these never Trump yeah, supporters yeah. and that takes away from rebutting someone like Trump. Importantly, we also think that Trump is less likely to attack the Democrats on airtime when he's also going to have to attack those moderate Republicans yeah, yeah. who we have now said that we are actually in favor of in some instances. We think that that looks like he, him attacking people on Democrats on the affirmative side for being too uncompromising and for not recognizing that their policies are often similar to some of what those moderate Republicans put forward. Okay, firstly on this point of rebuttal about why we, why we won't actually be seen as Republican panderers or incite voter apathy. So that there's four reasons under this. Firstly, we think that the last election shows that the, the, the last election has shown Democrat supporters that they can't be Bernie or bust. They can't yeah, not show yeah. up to the polls. They need to get out to the polls if they don't want Trump to regain that presidential power. We think that it's significantly worse for them to have Trump in power than to have a Democrat who may have moved slightly more away from the most yeah, left yeah. Democrat supporters. We think that you're not going to get apathy. There wasn't enough mechanisms for that. Secondly, we think that especially with the Black Lives Matter protests and this huge mobilization of those sort of more progressive left views that even someone like who Biden, who is a centrist Democrat represents, we think that we see more support for that and we see more support for the um, democratic movement. Thirdly, we think that even if we lost the extreme left supporters like the Bernie or Bust people, we think that they're a very small percentage of the Democrat support base. And we in fact are more likely to get supporters under our policy where we're able to capture some of those swing moderate Republicans. Yeah, yeah. And we think that that would be greater. We think that's states like Florida. So we think that's a worthwhile toss up. Fourthly, we think that voting for Biden over Bernie in like the most recent Democrat election tracking shows that the Democrat supporters are tracking more towards the center. They yeah, aren't yeah. the whole leftist people who are solely about um, Bernie and solely about that incredibly um, left progressive economic policy. They are interested in Biden, who is significantly more towards the center than Bernie. We think that responds to the point that um, their first affirmative brought up about like Democrats hating corporate funding and yeah, whatnot. Yeah. Okay, first point on why we're likely to get the presidential election under our side of the house. We think that there are two things that occur here. Firstly, either we're able to consolidate um, an, a win, like we're able to get an increased margin of a win, or we're likely to get the tipping point on our side, which gives us an election win. So we think that in either side, we're likely to get that um, presidential election win. Three reasons why. Firstly, we think it's important to note that Trump and the very right Republicans will never support Democrats. That's something that is completely out of the scope of anyone getting support in the debate. We think that secondly, that never Trump supporters who are the sort of moderate Republican members are people who do not like Trump. We know that Trump is going to be the next Republican nominee. We know that it is not going to be one of those never Trump supporters. That means that those never Trump supporters are actually more likely to align with and to see like democratic views as something that they would support over that sort of Trump policy. We think that the Democrats suffer to a degree in elections as a result of being oppositionists to the whole Republican party, yeah, yeah. particularly those moderates. We think that toss up states like Florida, Pennsylvania, Aristotle, Arizona and Wisconsin have those moderate Republicans and we think that those swing states are able to swing more democratically when we don't shit on their Republican um, candidates who are more moderate. We think that Wisconsin and Pennsylvania capture that Rust Belt area and we think that they often like economic policies which might be um, economic Republican policies but might be in favour of more sort of progressive other things. Yeah, so yeah. we think that like with Trump and how he's handled his economic policies such as like COVID resulting in job loss in Detroit or his trade war with China he's actually starting to lose those Rust Belt states. He's starting to lose that. We think that's really good for outside of the house we should be capitalizing on that we also think that when the democrats oppose and attack um the whole base the republican base we 
see that the moderate Republicans are unable to swing because it is completely un, like impal impalatable for them to see Democrats who just shit on all the economic policies from Republicans, even the most moderate, the more moderate, yeah, yeah. even the more realistic ones, such as how we see Romney and Collins support healthcare, but they also want to see some growing domestic industry. We think that's something that Biden can benefit on and something that he can use. So what we think we see is we see our Democrats showing that they are going to step out of that bipartisan game, step out of the whole back and forth between Republican um, and Republican and Democrats. And that means that those people who aren't just people who will never not re vote Republican, those moderate people, are likely to swing towards the Democrats. We think that's incredibly important. The third thing here is we think that never Trump Republicans have a strong cult of personality, particularly yeah, outside yeah. of the states that they come from. So even though Mitt Romney comes from Utah currently, he was born in Detroit, and Mich and that means he captures Detroit and Michigan to a large extent. He has a strong cult of personality there. He was also the governor of Massachusetts. He's Mormon, and he's been an army man. That means that he captures a large base. That means it's incredibly important that you do keep someone like that more on side than just to shit on them. Remember, when it comes to Trump or Biden, if you have not shadowed Mitt Romney, his supporters are more likely to go towards Biden than they are towards Trump. We think that, that means we capture some of the Rust Belt, the Bible Belt. Um, that means we capture a lot of what um, uh, Mitt Romney won before Obama's presidency, which was in Florida. The conclusion of this is that the Democrats have a good stronghold already in the Black Belt and the Sun Belt with Latin America. And now we're able to secure those sorts of seats in the Rust Belt and the Bible Belt, which otherwise wouldn't occur. In the world of the government, people are more likely to vote Trump over Biden because you have completely alienated even the moderate Republicans. This comes particularly with Biden being more centrist and someone who has on the political covenants is closer to these never Trump supporters than Trump is to them. Okay, why do we win the Senate elections? Firstly, um, on Congress elections, firstly on the Senate. We think that Trump presidency is only part of this and that the 21 Republican seats which are up for election are incredibly important in this debate. Note that there are only 12 Democratic seats up for election. So if we were to win half of the, um, if we are to win half of or a large proportion of those Republican seats up for election, we have the capacity to control the Senate. Currently, the Democrats have a slim minority. They're losing in the Senate with Republicans having 53 seats. We think that almost half of those seats are up for election, which means there's a huge capacity to change the, how the Senate currently is constructed. We think that senators are more centrist. They're often Republican in that centrist way. They're not Trump. We're not talking about Trump. We're not talking about avid Trump voters when we talk about these Senate elections. That means that we can still oppose Trump on that presidential level, but we're able to get more of those centrist and moderate Republicans on our side. And that's because those Republicans have often lost popularity with Trump, right? Trump isn't someone who they're interested in supporting. And when we seem more reasonable as a Democrat party, because we're not playing that constant bipartisan game, we're more likely to get those seats. We only need five. And, and that would impact things like our ability to get impeachment, our ability to pass budgets. Yeah, that would be yeah. critical to us. We're also likely to see similar mechanisms taking place in the House of Representatives, where the Democrats already have a degree, like a, a degree of success, but we could see us recapturing and holding on to more states or getting stronger. All right, why are we likely to win state elections? We think that all these governor elections are going to impact um, are important because of the census vote that's coming yeah, and that will yeah. alter the boundaries. That looks like being able to change gerrymandering or at least prevent it from occurring more. We think that Republicans have previously held these sort of governor positions and therefore have been able to gerrymander. When we're able to stop this, that means that we're likely to see less gerrymandering and that we're also like to see swing states starting to maybe still have a Republican governor, but maybe have deputies who are from the Democrats. And that was incredibly important because we've got better outcomes and more power to the Democrat Party, power to negate. I think this Whenever will be the speech, and I'd now like to invite up the second affirmative speaker to continue the team's case. Cool. Um, you can hear me, right? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay. Yeah. Starting in three, two, one. Negative case is absolutely hilarious. It relies on two fundamentally weird presumptions. Number one, there's a way in which the Democratic Party can selectively choose specific anti-Trump Republicans and only associate with them while disassociating from others. Number two, it relies on perfect perception of the American people of every single niche that the Democrat Party wants to portray with actually no analysis coming from first negative of what these voter blocks are, how they perceive messages, and how media machines work. So then not being charitable to first half makes no sense. First response, 
Um, Never Trump supporters are not pro Reagan, they're Mitt Romney. Four sets of responses for why this is untrue. Number one, there is no incentive to select only few. This is because some of the most powerful Republican messages have come from Mitt uh, Ronald Reagan with speeches like the city hall speech that won him the election. Second, there are individuals like John Bolton, who is an ex defense minister of Donald Trump that you would strategically want to use against him by showing that it is an internal faction. Third, it is uh, there are things like John McCain, who were also people that were against uh, Donald Trump, but are also massive figures in the Republican Party. It is unclear why you'd want to selectively perceive the few underpowered people for your gains, where all your analysis relies on these people being powerful. How exactly are you going to have an incentive to selectively exclude a lot of powerful people? They can't fear this. This is a likelihood motion. There was no analysis of why that is likely from their side. It's not a motion of policy. Second, Association with one associates with all. The analysis from First Affirmative was not to just base on association with Reagan, but to association on pro-establishment. So even taking their own examples, Mitt Romney is the biggest pro-establishment person in the last 20 years. He was anti-taxes, pro-businesses. All the harms that First Affirmative talk about apply in those examples as well. But third, it's also about association indirectly. And that's why they fail to address the kinds of nuance that First Affirmative set up. The first reason is the moment you have them in any way or form in your platform, that is direct ammunition by which Trump can use Fox News, social media campaigns to subtly send brand messages where they put a flash picture to send perceptions of Ronald Reagan, uh, Ronald Reagan being supporting by Biden. And then use that message to just show that this person is pro-establishment unlike him. Second, there are ways in which indirect perception operates as well, where the moment a media reporter asks this individual a question, how do you feel about XYZ Republican, that one association is enough for them to be insecure at the point in time that they're suffering from COVID-19 crisis and associate with all establishment policies because that's how irrational voting in the current context works. Unless there's analysis for why these voters are rational and will perceive this analysis rationally, there is no way any of the benefits first negative standards for makes sense. The responses to voter apathy are hilarious, which is they realize they can't be Bernie or bust. Number one, that was pre-COVID. The moment COVID crisis happened, they realized welfare systems suck. They realized that the healthcare policies that Bernie stood for are more important. Evidence of this is Biden shifting more to the left, where he's wanting to form policy changes with Bernie in healthcare, rather than sticking to an outright stanch centrist position. The context is one where Biden is shifting to the left rather than staying in the center because of these insecurities. Number two, it's untrue that you don't have options beyond that. The existing the existence of the Black Lives Matter movement shows extra democratic movements that violate laws are able to take place. So the option is no longer get Trump out of power or do nothing. The option can be whoever is in power, I will protest the fuck out of you and make sure that you don't get votes or you have to change policies. So a lot of irrational extra democratic pressure can also be exercised. The nuance here is people are irrational. Unless they prove rationality of people, these extra democratic means are more likely. The next thing they say is Democrats are more to the center. I think I've already proven to you why they're more to the center left rather than to the center. But here's a piece of additional framing. The additional framing is it's unclear why we need to have policy changes while risking the kinds of things that could put us into power. This does not only matter about the presidential election, but also matters in questions like the Senate election. This is what these guys want to hedge their case around. Um, so here's a bit of context. Number one, Arizona, Florida, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, all of these are states that made Trump win. And all polls show that these are states that Biden is currently winning or states in which senator elections are currently winning. The reason why this analysis doesn't work for opposition is this context can change. We already have a win, but the moment we associate with the other side, this can change. So if they agree to this context, we don't need additional support. We don't need additional centrism to secure those areas because we're winning anyway. The analysis coming from First Leg is contradictory. If you're winning them, what's the point of getting the additional support? You need to make sure that you have the ability to not associate and lose. There was no response to why you're not likely to lose because of the pro-establishment dynamic that is associated with these kinds of things. Moreover, on positive material, why do we think that these states are worse when you have the ability to associate with these things? Number one, 
We think the way in which you associate makes sure that these governors are more likely to come into power, these senators are more likely to come into power, rather than the ones you currently support from the Democratic base. Which means, assuming there are 24 Republican seats, the moment you subtly endorse one, that gives more ammunition for that person to use his media airtime to promote his own policies and win those seats, seats that he's currently losing. So you shifting to the center, does not shift the center to you as well, where your centrist candidate wins. You shifting to the center allows these people to win in strongholds that they have historically had. The nuance is the legacy exists for them, not for you. Comparative advantage exists for them, not for you. So the moment you shift to the center, that empowers them, not you, to pass policies. Secondly, even if your own individuals win, what you're likely to need is to carry out horse trading issues. So what this looks like is saying that we settle for centrist issues, saying that we settle for more centrist policies. We think this is critical for a couple of reasons. Number one, the reason why pandering and horse trading is one of the biggest issues of American politics now is because of the COVID-19 response by Trump, where states that were economically beneficial were horse traded against. That's why California got resources to cater to 100% of budget needs, while some states were left behind, which include Arizona, which include Florida. These are the states that we are talking about in question, and they have the greatest degree of insecurity when it sees two pro-establishment parties working together and horse trading against each other, where they feel like they're not the ones in question. But secondly, and most importantly, even if you shift to the center, it harms your legacy as a democratic party and what you stand for. This is because the vast majority of voters who are to the pro-left that you need to galvanize obviously are going to bust or go extra democratic. That's what I've already proven. But what you're also likely to do is any and all policy that you pass is not going to be credited to the democratic party, but is going to be seen as a bipartisan entrenchment where both parties work together. That means in the long run, if you want to shift the way these states perceive parties and avoid leaders like Trump, you need to make it seem like you're not on the center in the long run. This prevents, let's say we get rid of Trump, any and all right-wing leader in the future can show that any centrist policy that marginally caters to everyone but leaves out a vast majority of vulnerable individuals means those people are, uh, those people are catering to corporations and not for you. What this allows is future right-wing leaders to stand up. We think that's a bad thing. The platform that leftist policies have in an era of COVID-19 crisis and an era of vulnerability is unlike anything else in history. We cannot sacrifice the one platform we have to establish a center-left legacy that can change America forever. We are very glad to propose. Okay, can you, are you all ready? Yeah, I think the speaker for this speech, I'd now like to invite up the second negative speaker to continue the team's case. All right. I will start in three, two, one. The easiest way to understand why the affirmative team has lost this debate is in two key things they assume that they actually haven't proven. One is that moving stronger to the left and not becoming center will benefit the Democrat party and able for them to capture against Republicans. Second is that the political community in the United States is anti-establishment and therefore if we co-opt the center, we will lose the election. So I'm gonna deal with those two characterizations and prove why systematically we are able to secure a greater margin or because polling is so insecure, we thought Hillary had a huge swing. Look what happened then. We absolutely make sure the margin is as big as possible to ensure that we have a room for error. The first thing I wanna do is characterize what are the never republic uh, never trump supporters uh, the never trump republicans that we're talking about because we weren't selective right we said that it's Susan Susan Collins Lisa Murkowski Mitt Romney which are very there are very few never Repub uh, never trump republicans in the status quo they they like it's not just true that these we are selectively picking that we said these are the people that have been oppositional to trump so some people might be like less evil, like less right than Trump, but those who are not never Trump supporters, they give you no reasons for why we are selectively picking them. The second thing that they say is that, look, obviously there's a perception that you can't remove yourself from because there's a by association, you're associated to the establishment candidates. This brings me to the fact that association with the establishment is actually very, very good for the Democrat party. First reason for why we think this is true is because look at the way Democrat primaries work. If people didn't like corporate money, if people liked strongly uh, like people funded funding and like Bernie's who was very much pro-left, Biden wouldn't have won the primary so comprehensively, even in places where he didn't. Second, is even when Hillary Clinton was seen as crooked, seen as someone who was more likely to take money from prisons, we still, uh, like Democrat primaries, still lean towards Hillary. Third, is most oftentimes, even with the COVID, because of the COVID situation, people realize that they can't have super left politics.
policies or super right policies because they realize it is a compromise of both, which is we want some democrat, some domestic investment. We would like some things like relief of taxes. We want some control for the uh, for, for states to ensure that they are able to find COVID. So their own mechanism of COVID making them anti-establishment makes no sense because as anti-establishment politics means you would lean so strongly to the left, which put money in things like welfare, which a lot of Americans currently that they are being uh, they are currently unemployed are very opposed to, which means statistically or like structurally speaking, speaker, it is not true that Repub uh, that the American population is anti-establishment. The Republic, uh, the American population, even the Democrat voting base is largely pro-establishment. They gave you no reasons for why us being associated with establishment harms us. We say that perception actually benefits us. The second thing I want to say in terms of what these never, Repub never Dem uh, Trump supporters are is their argument that by association, Trump is now going to attack us. Ask yourself the comparison. Is Trump more likely to attack a Democrat party that has no compromise, that is seen as un-Republican because they don't care about our values? Or is Trump more likely to attack a Democrat party that has at least taken some moderate support, right? Because if Trump uses Fox News to attack Mitt Romney, attacks the Democrat party for being nice to Republicans, that would absolutely lose him. People in the Senate, for example, lose his own support base in Republican states that like Mitt Romney. Mitt Romney has a cult of personality in very important swing states like Michigan, in swing states like Massachusetts, for example, he was the governor. He's also a moment that captured quite a significant number of religious people. Ask yourself, if Trump is going to attack people in both worlds, who is he more likely to attack in a world in which Democrats are uncompromising? So at this point, this debate, I have comprehensively proved two things. First is that they are, there are never Republicans that we are defending in outside are the majority, are in fact every single one I have named you. Second is that being anti-establishment is going to harm you in the long run as a Democrat party. And third, Trump is more likely to attack you in your world as opposed to ours. Next thing I want to talk about this debate is who ensures the presidential election? Because Sajid is right. Obviously, Biden has a current um, swing in Pennsylvania, Michigan, and Wisconsin based on election polls. The first thing I want to say is it is not true that he has an outright majority. If you look at all kinds of swings, uh, all kinds of polls, these are toss-up states, right? Because we haven't been able to comprehensively prove this. The second is polls shift all the time. Like, I wouldn't want you to make this debate entirely just about the polls because we, those are unreliable actors. But the third thing I want to say is to the degree that we have a margin of victory in those states, we would call consolidate and make that margin bigger. Why are we likely to make the margin bigger? Their argument is, in these swing states, if we associate with a center Republican, that means we're likely to get them more support than ours. Is this likely to be true? Here are four, three reasons for why this is actually not true. The first is, if we are the party that is compromising with moderate Republicans, we get the ability to do things like, say, we are centrist, we are willing to compromise. That kind of op like that kind of support for things like we don't want to be bipartisan, because the last time we were so bipartisan, they literally shut down the government and people couldn't get resources. So a lot of people are going to see Democrats as favorable, because we are the one that is extending the olive branch in this debate. The second thing that we say by association is a lot of people in the states are not very pro-democrat. They're also not very pro-republican. There are people that are in the moderate that are willing to have some form of policy that both parties can kind of share. It like changes. Like for example, Florida was won by Trump this time. Last time it was won by Obama. So the point is, it is a policy that are likely to be sought. If you say to the people in the states, we oppose all Republicans, no matter how centered they are, no matter how reasonable they are, because John McCain before he died and Bush very much were in like support by uh, people like um like Nancy Pelosi and Obama, if you say we oppose all Republicans, then in their mind, they will say, this is a Democrat party that is not willing to compromise. This is a Democrat party that is not a center policy. So they will make the choice to maybe vote in Trump still because Trump at least has some moderate Republicans that are on their side. That is why if we have a margin of win now, we should consolidate that by capturing people from the moderate. And the second thing is these people have huge cults of personality, which means having them alone means that we are likely to sway them to Democrats because most of these political parties, most of the people in this state are moderate, are not just Republican for the sake of it. But I want to note, these are gains we get in the swing state. What is their only argument in the debate? Their argument is we will have voter apathy because obviously there's voter apathy because people are irrational and people obviously in the spot of COVID want to vote in a set of really extremely left, uh, um, uh, uh, extremely left um, a Democrat candidate. Here are a couple of reasons for why this is untrue. Ellen gives you many reasons for why. A, people have become less irrational in the status quo. They were irrational during um, Trump versus Hillary because they were like, we were Bernie and Bus. We Trump is not going to win, but we'll take a stance against it. Most people who are African Americans, Latin Americans, know things like detention, ICE being funded, things that Trump have happened are such horrible ills that they cannot support. So no matter who we put on the Democrat Party um, ticket, they are always going to vote for us. So we have secured the Sunbelt. We have secured things like the um, like the uh, black populations in America, you must ask yourself, who 
are these people who are so left that the opposition, uh, that the government team is so scared of losing this debate? They are so few and they're not very important. Second is their own argument, right? The COVID insecurity hasn't made people more left. It has made people realize that there is indeed a need to compromise in politics. Because look at the status quo, right? The Senate is controlled by the uh, Republicans and the House of Reps is controlled by the Democrats, which has led to things like an inability to pass things like bare minimum welfare policies that are actually quite center and most modern Republicans kind of support, which means to say COVID hasn't made people irrational. It has made people more likely to want a compromise in the status quo. For those reasons, we think it is untrue that we will lose huge amounts of the, our current voter base because they know from the last election that it was a mistake. Second, is that we're able to capture people in a way in which that is, um, in a way in which that we, uh, in a way in which it secures our current vote. The third thing is voter equity. Their argument is, oh, we will lose our strong base, the people who are our side. But look at the way social movements have been galvanized, right? The BLM movement, most of the feminist organizations in the United States, which means to say our strongholds of the Democrat Party are always going to vote for us because they are mobilized in a way that supports Biden. People don't support Bernie and large. Then you must ask yourself, if I'm willing to concede, maybe we will lose the people who are super left. What is the gain in this debate? The gain in this debate are the vast majority of swing, the moderate people who are likely to vote, even if they vote for a moderate Republican. This is the worst case, yeah? They vote for a moderate Republican. At least that moderate Republican who is a never Trump like Mitt Romney is like favorable to the Democrat, which means in state elections, where there's a census going to happen, they will do things like not gerrymander the screws over because they know we are our allies. Speaker, Either we get a Republican that is moderate in most of the states and we say that benefits us because we are seen as more supporting and more likely to like, engage with these people. Even if we don't, we think we get a huge portion of people in the moderate. For those reasons, we think it is comprehensively not true that swinging more left will get you anywhere in this election. I thank the speaker for this speech. I'd now like to invite up the third affirmative speaker to continue the team's case. Hi, am I audible? Yes, you are. All right, thanks. Just give me a couple of seconds. Starting three, two, one. Okay, I think there are many few things that are wrong with this, this negative side. I think the first is the most important because all of their benefits are literally that there are some states right now that we have a possibility of not winning despite some degree of comprehensive polling. So in those marginal cases, it would be good if we compromised the position of left support to gain some degree of voters in those areas. I'll show you why, number one, their process of endorsement does not suggest this kind of a small change. And if it was that this change is so small, none of their own claimed benefits accrue. Second, I'll show you the mechanism by which they suggest change is one that does not require you for this uh, to have this endorsement. Firstly, I'll, I'll deal with firstly the engagement to second leg. Because in our second, uh, second half speech, we gave you two reasons why you are unlikely to be able to selectively pick individuals when you go and endorse these uh, um, uh, never, tr never Trump uh, gr uh, group of uh, Republicans. Why is this the case? Well, first, because these are individuals who likely have a large degree of sway and power within those areas. You would not strategically uh, kind of not select them because those are literally the only benefits you get. What is the response in second neck? This is actually laughable. What they say is that, ah, these are very few Republicans. Whilst in first neck, they say this is a majority of people, which was also their mech for actually getting those votes turned in the first place. So if either of these characterization is true, either you have massive degrees of compromise or the flip is you actually don't get the votes you say are changed because you don't get a lot of support from those people. We think that was the first really quick uh, kind of deadlock that they establish in their own mechanism that kind of fails them their benefits. But the second thing that they completely ignore from our speech is that even if it is the case that you are not directly like giving these individuals support, it is inevitable that there are indirect associations. What does this look like? It means that when there are issues in media where you are asked of your opinion on those individuals, you will have to take a completely neutral position. So if it, for example, comes down to a policy of being isolationist or going further into foreign policy, you will have to go with the position that these individuals would likely suggest. 
what is then the impact of this in terms of perception? They say on NEC that being established, pro-establishment is great. What they've explained though, are examples of the current form of pro-establishment that Biden already is, one which is Democrat leaning. But what we suggested from first half is, you shift this rhetoric to a pro-Republican establishment, which is primarily in isolating to these individuals, which means you are more center right in that perception of establishment as opposed to the latter. Even if none of this was true, we told you that it does not matter what the absolute position is individuals have a lack of ability to exactly understand the situation because of the degree of due risk they were in. What is their response to this? They said that people, for some reason, have realized from their past mistakes that they don't need to be irrational. I think what they realized is they need to consider more facts and make better decisions. That's great. But guys, they don't have jobs. They don't have food. They are scared. There is police riots everywhere. That is not the time where you make calculated decisions about what specific choices you make in your policy actually yield in the future. That means you work on your instincts and your impulses. And if your impulses say that Biden is someone who we had trusted previously is now shifting towards people who we don't want in power, that is the messaging that you create. That is an inevitable deadlock that they were unable to show does not happen, which means this degree of support Democrats receive is actually reduced. What is the impact they suggest that happens? They say that you perhaps lose some left. I'll explain to you the nature of the current demo uh, demographics of the uh, election right now, because the individuals who you would need for winning these elections are some of those swing states. Specifically, you would need people across Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, Michigan, etc. In these areas, there are two groups you have to uniquely cater to. Number one, African Americans in the vast majority of places, and secondly, working class individuals. I think the second is something that is perhaps more swayed by things like economic policy. So I want you to note, what is their mechanism for change? They said there are two ways we want to make change. Number one, we don't want to endorse people. That was their attempt at responding to our perception thing. We want to respond to policy. If it is the case that you're responding to policy, why do you need to endorse these people? You already have the same policy positions. So if you want the working class to expect benefit from your policy, you already get that in these places. We think that's the first reason why these swing states are not being marginally won by the Democrats. They are being won by double digit figures. This is different from Hillary's popularity ratings because this is the position of polling with respect to the, each individual senator in those areas who are democrat leaning secondly what has this caused in terms of the actual swing in elections this has caused the democrats to gain a lot of benefit across places that they have historically never won places like kansas in places like iowa but there has been conservative majorities have been largely swung because of the current position of center left that biden is endorsing so we think just outright with this response, we've already shown to you why all of their mechanisms for change are either symmetric or things which get worsened. But what is the complete thing they absolutely ignore? Do we need this? We told you that the reason why Biden has a high chance of winning is because he has already been able to rally a lot of the current re re relevant voters, specifically underprivileged minorities like Africans, uh, African-Americans and, his, uh, and uh, Hispanics. Why was he able to do this? Number one, this is someone who has aligned with the left and supported things like Bernie's policies. Secondly, this is someone who has suggested a lot of things in terms of police persecution laws and increase in the support for persecution of these people and in response to the BLM protests. Third, this is someone who has already been historically endorsed in VP to Obama. These are things which has gained him a lot of popularity. Fourth, his vi vice president's shortlist, if he comes into power, is three African-American women. All of those are structural reasons in his decision-making calculus that has led to immense degrees of support amongst these population. We think this was extremely relevant because we suggested a shift in the democratic demographics in the face of COVID means that individuals want reform. He has uniquely previously isolated some African-American youth. That is literally his biggest challenge right now. You completely shun them away if even a fraction of the impacts of perception of endorsement are true on our side. So we think first, you risk these large group of people. But secondly, they completely ignore all of the explanation in first half about how African-Americans uniquely have a difficulty in voting. We note the context of COVID makes this even more difficult. But what becomes the problem? The last time they ended up voting despite these difficulties, they realized it led to led to no benefit, which means that their position of commitment to voting has a lot of cost. So you need to give them a strong reason for that commitment. When you create these kinds of ideological conflicts within their choice to vote, you deny them that objective and change in perception to actually go in and vote. All of this then means that you risk the people who are currently winning you the elections, who won you the primaries in a convincing manner for the sake of some degree of new moderate voters who you could already get on our side, which means that is not a world in which you want to increase the risk of losing so highly to the risk of so little gain.
The last thing in terms of Trump's impact in all of this, we suggested that Trump already has a unique position to shit on everyone. What does this mean? Even if their case is true, then we show you that you can still do a lot of terrible things like call this a Democrat conspiracy when you have actively screwed Trump over with your decision to side against him. Maybe he won't be nice to you. Maybe he'll be more inflammatory. What does any kind of evidence suggest of what Trump will do? But then all of the things we said in first step about how this worsens perceptions even further and pushes you further away, away from the left is a definite harm that arises on their side, whilst their harm of Trump is largely symmetrical. What is the conclusion then? Presumably, in terms of the Senate election and the actual election outcome, we have a significant position to win. The last thing that they completely ignore on their side is that center is perhaps the best thing, but in this case, they ignore the arguments we made in terms of losing seats to those people in the future, in terms of having horse trading within these parties and the failure to leave a legacy with the risk of a future future Trump coming into power because you were not able to establish a Democrat stronghold when you had this unique chance. For all of those reasons, if you want the best for people and the vulnerable people in America, vote affirmatively. I thank the speaker for their speech. I'd now like to invite up the third negative speaker to continue their team's case. Hi, um, am I audible? Yeah. Uh, wait, one second. Oh, where's my phone? Where's mine? Uh, is yours one left? Huh? Mine isn't left. You have debate for one. What do you mean debate for one? Sorry, sorry, sorry. You can move my phone. Yeah. I'll start with the big framing question in this debate as to who really wins this debate and how do you win this? Because there is some weird stuff with regards to legacy in their side, but they don't explain as to why that's impactful or why that matters. But if anything, the most important thing for a democratic legacy would be to beat Trump in the next election and care about things such as the House of Representative election, the House of Senate election, and the state elections, which means that the elections that are upcoming are the most crucial, both for the legacy of Democrats, but also for the sake of this debate. Also, just in general, given that this is not an actor debate, overall, we would not want Trump to win the election, given the fact that Trump has done so many wrong, like, so much bad to minority groups and so on and so forth, regardless of what version of Biden we present to them, it will always be marginally better. I don't think affirmative would disagree with this. That is the most important thing. So firstly, with regards to some analysis that I think is weirdly framed across F, right? Sometimes it sounds like they're talking about some general votes. Sometimes it, talks, it seems like they're talking about leftist votes. I'm going to take them all down regardless of like the framing of it because they haven't been super concise about it. So I have six things on this in terms of like election um, stuff from their side. Like these, these are all things that I'm giving them credit to and being really, really generous about it. Number one. COVID-19 has changed the landscape so much that it is going to, like, it, it, it means that we want super left policies, right? Here's the problem. Our general strategy as the Democratic Party right now is not to put up someone who's far left. It's Biden, which means in general, even if COVID-19 has shifted a huge part, chunk of the population towards the hard left, I'm not sure the me mechanism through which they get any policy under their side, because Biden is not proposing universal health care. He's probably proposing a better version of Obamacare overall, meaning that that is the sort of health care that they want. Here's the comparison, right? Trump is taking away health care from people. People understand this. They support Biden with this particular regard. And they say, in this particular instance, um, if you are with like anti-Trump Republicans, that's a problem. No. Do you know who, who wrote Obamacare? 
Romney Care was one of the names of Obamacare because Romney co-wrote Obamacare, meaning the Republicans had a huge part to play in writing healthcare systems, et cetera, et cetera. But more importantly, I think it's important to understand that healthcare systems are not written by a singular party in America because of the way in which Senate, Congress, et cetera, et cetera, often like swing both ways and do not have like a super majority on either side. American people understand this because they understand American politics better than you guys, because you guys think America is a leftist utopia. It's not. Secondly, association with establishment politics and the irrationality of people. Guys, it's Biden. He's as establishment as it can be. To that, third affirmative sort of shifts it and says, it's going to be democratic establishment and somehow democratic establishment is better than Republican establishment. Here's the thing, right? Democratic establishment overall, if you look through their analysis, their analysis is there's a group of people who are absolutely anti-establishment. If that is true, then under your side, you have no mechanism as to how to get their vote. Because in general, yeah. Biden in general is very pro-establishment. He has not given any signs of going like pandering through the left. They said, oh, but Bernie Sanders is there. Bernie Sanders has already endorsed us. If that is a benefit yeah. on your side, that is symmetric on both sides, which means establishment politics is not a problem here. But more importantly, since when does America care a lot about establishment? America is not as left as you think it is. America does not care about establishment politics. In fact, they prefer it to Trump to a certain extent in certain instances. Thirdly, this weird analysis of, oh, you have association with Reagan and you cannot select the people you associate with. Here's the problem, right? When it comes to associating with Republicans, there's not a lot of people who are anti-Trump right now. It benefits the Republican Party wholly to be pro-Trump. So majority of Republicans are indeed pro-Trump. There's a small minority of people, small minority of very crucial people like Mitt Romney, who are actually anti-Trump that we want to take. And they have not been pro-Reagan. If anything, they have been associated with the Bushes in terms of policy statement. And these are like these are people, like people of America have voted for these presidents in the past. I'm not sure why association with Reagan is generally so bad. They say, oh, because it's anti-tax. Give me one reason why people of America on the majority are pro-tax. No reason as to why that's true. Fourthly, oh, we are so anti-Republican, we cannot find anything in common with them. Vast majority of individuals who swing votes, ladies and gentlemen, are people who have voted both Democrat and Republican across their lifetime. People who voted for Obama has voted for Trump. That was one of the biggest problems we had in the last election. If anything, American politics and American people are plagued with the fact that there's so much partisan squabble that they want any, something beyond it. They want people to act across the aisle. Under their side, we would just be like, we would literally be against people who are speaking in favor of us and saying that Trump is bad. Guess what signal that puts to people? If anything, association with some Republicans isn't a bad thing. American people actually want this. This is true, particularly in the context of America. Fifthly, oh, African-American votes. Guys, Biden has endorsement of Obama. One of the main reasons why Biden beat Bernie was because yeah, yeah. like of the African-American votes. And all of the reasons as to why you think that African-American votes are going to go towards far left, it's not. If that would have happened, then Bernie would have had some chance. Bernie had to drop out of the race, not even like go to the finish line. Let's drop out of the race. That was, that was as bad as it was. Which means overall, what does this debate then boil down to? It boils down to certain groups of people who can actually swing elections, right? And here it here, uh, here are comprehensive reasons why. First, they have given no mechanism as to why they get the far left vote. But even if I assume that they get the far left vote, we get moderate individuals who have voted both Democrat and Republican in their lifetime. The reason this is important is moderate Republicans, without us having the endorsement of these people or without us like associating ourselves with centrist Republicans, are going to vote Donald Trump anyways, because guess what? In general, in the political spectrum, they're more right than a leftist like Biden, Biden under their world would look like. The reason this is important is even if we don't get a leftist vote, a leftist vote is never going to Donald Trump. At best, they're going to sit at home. We are getting a vote that is going to go to Donald Trump come to us. So minus one, plus one, and also minus one on their side. The math suggests that this is better for us. Secondly, it's very hard to get rid of incumbency bias, which is to say that people do vote for incumbent presidents for a long, long time. And in this particular instance, it's very important for us to break through that incumbency bias. The only way we can do this is to appeal to the moderate leanings of these people. Vast majority of these people, especially in places such as Florida and Wisconsin, are moderate leaning and are tied to cults of personality. By the way, no response to that cult of personality that these people have. The fact that Mitt Romney is a Mormon, the fact that they do have some bit of nostalgia for the Republican Party of the past, we can swing these votes. To that, they say, oh, polls suggest we are going to win clear anyways. 
really guys the last time we thought polls are going to make us win clearly was hillary guess what that how that, that turned out we need florida you're not going to get florida by by trying to be fake bernie that that's quite important lastly no analysis with regards to the fact that we cross the aisle and get a lot of benefits to begin with. Even if Biden wins the presidency, right, under their side, you still need support such House of Representatives, Senate, et cetera, et cetera. There are quite, not a lot of people, but a few people who are like never Trump supporters within those places. The point at which you embrace them is the point at which you get endorsement for your policies for them as well. So the point at which you want to pass some healthcare policy, which requires, by the way, endorsement from House of, of, uh, like Congress, Senate, et cetera, et cetera, means that you need their support to get going within politics. And it's particularly important in this particular instance because of the simple reason that, because of the simple reason that under their side, they want to be super Democrats, super left, and won't ever budge to the Republican party, which means you will never get their support. Which means at the end, even if you were to confirm a high, like Supreme Court nominee, you couldn't under their world because they just don't cross the aisle and don't get enough votes. Under our world, Romney actually voted for impeachment of Trump and we have practical outcomes to that. If both sides win the elections, we get better policies under our side, by far, incredibly proud. Thank you, Mr. Ashwin. Thank you, Mr. I thank the speaker for their speech. I'd now like to invite up the negative leader to complete the team's case. Okay, I'm gonna start in three, two, one. The never Trump Republicans are few. That's why we said we are happy to support all of them, which is Susan Collins, Kowalski and Mitt Romney, and they haven't given reasons why we are being selective. But these few people, Speaker, are supremely influential, and that's why our, our benefits swing in this debate. Because I want to first ask ourselves, what is the current leaning of American politics? Because their entire case hedges on us believing that us becoming super left, because they said we want Biden to be more left, and like Biden is supporting of Bernie Sanders. Let's ask ourselves how viable of a strategy that is. The only population that they wanted to hedge their bets on are African-American people in this debate. We told you whilst voting is very difficult, these individuals have learned from the fact that they can't afford to sit at home and not do anything because that will lead to a Trump victory. And in fact, most African-Americans, Biden dropped out the race both for Hillary and Biden. And, and, uh, sorry, Bernie Sanders dropped out the race for both Hillary and Biden. If indeed the African-American population was so strong that they were able to sway Democrat votes, it wouldn't be true that Hillary and Biden would have won the primary, right? Which means to say even in the Democrat stronghold that is their best case in this debate, they've absolutely lost because they haven't given us reasons why Democrats like don't like establishment politics. They like big money in politics. That's why they supported Biden. That's why they supported Hillary, right? Which means to say, Speaker, it's very marginal in this debate that African-Americans who might stay at home and not vote in this debate. We must ask ourselves what the overall leaning of the population is. We have several reasons that went unresponded, which is first, the current situation doesn't make people more irrational. It makes people more rational. Given the COVID crisis, the need to compromise on policies in the middle, no one is swinging so far left that we're willing to get rid of the police. People want some reforms, which is weirdly enough, something that is supported by centrist policies like Mitt Romney, as well as Susan Collins, as well as Biden, have similar policies on this. The second is people know that being partisan and swinging so far to the left or the right has harmed American politics because it has led to things like huge amounts of inability to pass any kind of policy. Third is swing states, right? Those are people who are not inherently Republican. Those are people who are in the model who have swept, swapped between, like, for example, Obama and Trump. Those are the people who want things like stability, some form of politics that is compromising. And most importantly, and no response they had to this is most of these individuals that are never Trump Republicans have huge cults of personalities in very important states. Like Mitt Romney was born in Michigan. He's a governor of, um, of what do you call this, of Wisconsin. He has huge capacity to swing places like Bible Belt states because he's a Mormon. Those are the places you need to capture most importantly. And I want to ask yourself, is indeed Biden so far left? Because their argument is, if we if we abandon our left, we're going to lose. Biden isn't far left. Biden is a quite um, centrist policy in terms of the way he wants to impact COVID, for example, or for, for policies in terms of rights and social unrest. You must ask yourself, what are we losing in this debate? Is a very marginal, if at all we lose any left people, the people we gain are the vast majority of the of Republicans in this debate. Their only other response is Trump is going to attack us. Speaker, we comprehensively warned this when we told you that Trump is very less likely to any ammunition to attack a Republican as well as a Democrat cooperating as opposed to a Democrat party that is uncompromising, the crooked Hillary who doesn't care about our American public. We win in terms of attacking, we win in terms of policies, which means you have to ask yourself, what is this debate about? So either Biden is going to win no matter what. If Biden wins no matter what, surely let us give you reasons for why we require some 
moderate Republicans and people in the middle to swing with us to pass things like policies in the Senate or in places like the House of Representatives. So even if Biden wins in the best case in both worlds, we still require some moderate support. Second, we say we're actually likely to secure a larger margin because, yes, you are right, they have a, Biden has a larger margin than Hillary in the swing states, but we know polls change. It is, even if the risk is small, we should not take that risk and consolidate the people because African-Americans in the states, out there, swing states, will always support us. It is the people who are economic middle, the people who are once the, the Rust Belt states, for example, the states that are more likely to support policies that are in the middle that are compromising. And the reason they will join our side and they didn't respond to this is because we as the Democrat Party have extended an olive branch. We have said we are willing to compromise. We are the ones that want you to join our side. Because look, if you, are, if you oppose all Republicans, these people are going to lean towards Republicans because they would rather some conservative politics. If we say we are more in the middle, we are likely to get these people on our side. We swing states that we win in terms of presidential elections, the Senate, and, and in terms of state elections. We say for these reasons, going super left is not going to make you do anything in this debate. If we lose some people marginally, if that best case, we would say that trade-off is a vast number of swing states for those reasons they have comprehensively lost this debate i thank the speaker for their speech i'd now like to invite up the leader of the affirmative to conclude the debate uh i'm audible right yes cool um Starting in three, two, one. In my two and a half years of debating with Shoradeep, we had this strategy. It was called the Hail Mary. In debates we knew we were losing, he would go out, spew random rhetoric and examples, and use that as a strategy to convince bad judges. Because if you look at his speech, which is a last ditch attempt of covering up structural analysis and its deficiencies with a barrage of examples that are nothing but mitigations, it shows you why negative are so insecure about their case. Their case relies on four premises. Number one, pro like they want to straw man our case as proving america is super left like guys this makes no sense we are not saying this is communist utopia we are saying it has shifted more to the left than the center than it was in the past this is based on negatives own analysis where they say biden won the election because of centrism and our analysis of covid then shifting it to the left and evidence of biden shifting to the left and working with barney show response to this on op whip is yeah but we're working with him anyway but guys, that is mitigation. Again, you might not get the perception from people that you are working with him. That was our entire case. Why you might lose out. Second, um, I think the next ditch effort is that you can never oppose Republicans. The first thing our first half said is, Trump opposes Republicans all the time, where he pulls troops out of Iraq, where he goes out and does things that are anti-establishment as an outsider to politics. There was no analysis beyond, you can do it to Hillary, but not to Republicans, when our evidence suggests you can. There was no secondary ditch. Third, you will only select few. This is suicidal, like few uh, never Trump supporters. Number one, they rely their analysis on examples rather than structural analysis of why there are few. Assuming that there are people like John Bolton, which we've also provided, are also Reagan supporters, that shows evidence that there are more than the few examples they talk about. Second, assuming that we take their examples, which is substitute for their analysis, which is their three or four few Trump supporters or anti-Trump supporters, by that logic, the number of swing states they also win is also marginal, something that our gov whip pointed out. And so the win on their world is also mar marginal. But third, and most crucially, we said that association with one means association with the entire establishment, analysis that they never engage to in nuance beyond rhetoric to suggest otherwise. The fourth premise on which they rely their case on is people are rational. This is because for some reason, when you lose jobs, when you are at a point of time where you are the most vulnerable in the last 100 years, people suddenly become rational, huh? The only example for this is rationality means investment and taxes. You know what investment and taxes are? center left, not center. Or we can argue it is center left and not center. And there was no analysis beyond people want to be center. Like the word center is not substitute for analysis, guys. I implore you to look through your notes. Why do we then think that we in win these elections? Number one, there was no analysis beyond America is not communist utopia to prove that America is moving structurally more to the left. The analysis is not that they move to the far left, but they move more to the left. Second, there was no response to the kinds of things we talked about in terms of voter apathy. The reason why this is crucial is the evidence and the frame for them to win elections is you have to convert people who are currently pro-Republican to your side, the other side. That's a big shift. 
all we have to do is make sure people show up to vote. That's a very small shift. But the reason why this shift is so crucial is because of the things first I've said, where personal costs are at an all time high during recession, which they never engaged to. The only mitigation we heard was Obama, you'll get votes anyway. Guys, Obama rallied you, yes, that's mitigation again. You might lose out on Obama support when you be seen as pro Romney healthcare, as Shodhi would like to say, and rather than pro Obama policies, which is count tantamount to what they want. Even if they are establishment, it is unclear why it will be seen as a compromise rather than be seen as weak, where you're unable to pass policies yourself and you're not here to stand out for us, but are here to stand out for corporations. Analysis that we also gave you. Lastly, they significantly ignored the long-term legacy this entrenches, not only by empowering Republicans within those areas where they are powerful anyway. This is where we flipped negatives analysis. If they are powerful, you are never going to take them off seats if you endorse them. If that is true, that premise is why none of their benefits are realized. We are very glad to have long-term legacy when it comes at the cost of these things. Very glad to win this debate. I thank the speaker for their speech and both teams for